All right, this is uh, musical numbers are being performed by the Emerson Elementary School Bell Ringers under the direction of Jenny Leavitt? Levitt, a uh, parent, and Sarah Johns, a second grade teacher. Uh, they w will perform the national anthem. Cool. If we could all rise. All right, before you guys all pack up, is there a student that wants to share with us uh, their experience, what they've learned, what they've gained from this amazing program? Hi, my name is German. We are the Emerson Bell Ringers and are so excited here to play for you tonight. Just a little bit about our group. The bell ringers at our school have been in existence for over 50 years. We are told we are the longest running bell choir for schools in the state of Arizona. A lot of our parents were even in bell, were even, even bell ringers at the school, including one of our directors, Mrs. Levitt. Our, our other director, Ms. Johns, is a second grade teacher at Emerson and plays in the, bell, in the bell choir at her church. This is her first year working with our group. We are made up of fifth and sixth grade students. There are 17 members of our ensemble. Over 40 students auditioned for this group, and we are the top applicants. We practice twice a week in the morning before school. As Emerson of the Bell Ringers, we, we go around the community and play for others. It is a great way for us to provide service. We are especially busy at Christmas time. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to play for you tonight on behalf of, uh, behalf of the Emerson community. We thank you for the service that you provide for the city of Mesa, particularly to the students and their families. Thank Pres you for that. President Smith, I was an Emerson bell ringer. So I, I don't know why they didn't ask me to do it, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> are, you, are you asking to play? <laughs> I actually played handbells too when I was in uh, seventh and eighth grade, so I have a real appreciation for it. And, and the gloves, the importance of the gloves. I think of all the students hold up the gloves. You, you're, are, are you still not allowed to touch the bells without the, without the gloves? Yeah. Very important, beautiful sound, um, beautifully orchestrated. Thank you, and we, we appreciate your coming and performing for us and for the for the group here. Uh, we're going to proceed now with a video on the governing board 
meeting procedures. Welcome to the Mesa Public Schools Governing Board meeting. We appreciate your interest in the district. The five elected governing board members volunteer countless hours and serve without compensation. The president and the clerk of the board are elected in January. Under state law, the governing board may only discuss and vote on matters that are on the agenda for tonight's meeting. Agendas are posted a minimum of 24 hours in advance on the Mesa Public Schools website and in the Curriculum Services Center. Copies of tonight's agenda are located in the lobby. Members of the public may speak to the agenda items. If you wish to comment on any agenda item, please fill out a request to address the board form. These forms are also located in the lobby. Before the item is discussed, please submit the completed form to the assistant to the governing board. Members of the public will be given a maximum of three minutes to speak. Once recognized by the governing board president, please state your name. We ask that all speakers show respect and courtesy to others. During the second regular meeting of each month, the agenda will include a call to the public, which is an opportunity to speak to the governing board about a school district matter that's not on the agenda. Please submit a request to address the board form to participate in the call to the public. If you want the governing board to consider adding an item to a future agenda, you may submit your request in writing to the board at least five working days before that meeting. The superintendent or the governing board president will consider your request. Thank you for your attendance and involvement in tonight's meeting. Okay, for, for both of those people that are watching online or on Channel 99, we're, we're still doing some cleanup while we wait um, for the bell ringers to uh, carefully handle those bells, those very delicate bells. Uh, I want to recognize Senator Sean Bowie, who came to join us. Uh, thank you for supporting uh, public education and, and what we're doing here. And uh, I, I know it's you're in session. You've already had a long day, so thank you for coming and spending the, the time with us and learning about what we're doing here in Mesa. I'd like to invite up Pastor Stephen Talmadge of the Love of Christian Lutheran Church. And in a moment, we'll have him offer the invocation in accordance with uh, Governing Board Policy BDDH. Uh, after that, we'll stand. Just about 15 seconds. Let us pray. Well, God, source of all goodness, we give you thanks for the gift of reason and the opportunity for education. Bless our schools that they may be places of learning and safety where teachers challenge the minds and nurture the hearts of students. Grant that teachers and students may work together in mutual respect and find joy in the challenges of academic life. Send your blessing on all who are engaged in the work of education. We give you thanks for the service of Superintendent Cowan and pray for clear discernment on who shall next serve in that capacity. Be with each member of this governing board as they seek to use their gifts to carry out the important trust placed in them to support the education this district seeks to provide for welfare of all. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for that. If we could stay standing. <laughs> I'm going to call the meeting to order, and uh, the Pledge of Allegiance will be led by Spencer Arnett from Troop 154, the first class in uh, Pat. He's going to come up to lead the pledge. Uh, first class um, at Pathfinder Academy. Join me. Please join me in the pledge. Thank you. We have some people standing around the edges. We've got some seats up front if, uh, if you wanted to 
take a minute to, all right, <laughs> guess not. Um, we have been a very busy board, so we've got some procedural stuff that we've got to get through, and then we'll, we'll get to the fun celebrations. Uh, but we've got uh, uh, some meeting minutes that we need to approve uh, based on some of the uh, conversations that we've had as a board. So can I get a motion to approve the uh, meetings of the, or the minutes of the regular meeting held February 13th, 2018? I move that we approve the minutes of the regular meeting held February 13th, 2018. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 And none opposed? Uh, can I get a motion to approve the minutes of the special meeting held February 20, uh, 20th, 2018? I make a motion that the minutes of the special meet the special meeting held on February twentieth be approved. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And none opposed. And a motion to approve the minutes of the special meeting held February twenty second, twenty eighteen. Can I get a motion? I move that we approve the minutes of the special meeting held February twenty second, twenty eighteen. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And none opposed. Uh, let's move to the certificate and classified personnel requests. Dr. Lesser will help you with that. President Smith, members of the board, we ask for your approval of the personnel requests, including the addendum that we've provided. Okay, can I get a motion? I move that we approve the certified and classified personnel requests, including an addendum. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And none opposed. Okay, uh, now we're going to move on to the consent agenda. Uh, all items will be listed. All items listed will be considered as a group and will be approved with one motion. There will not be a separate discussion of these items unless a board member or citizen requests, in which case the item will be removed and, uh, from the consent agenda and considered as a separate item. Uh, do I have any requests? Okay, can I get a mo uh, motion to approve the consent agenda? I move that we approve the consent agenda. All in favor? Aye. 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 And none opposed. Um, I, I do want to <laughs> quickly, before we go into the, uh, the superintendent's report, um, clarify that we do have some recovering sick board members, and they're up here. And I, I want to thank them for their dedication, um, struggling through cough drops and recovery and ZPAC <laughs> to be here with us uh, to do this work that we need to do. So uh, that's uh, Keanu and Steve. I don't know if it's that side of the room, but <laughs> no, I'm Do just you want some more cough drops? I think we're beyond that. That's why we're, we're safe. So with that, uh, Dr. Cowan. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us for tonight's governing board meeting. Two weeks ago, the governing board passed a resolution to rename Hawthorne Elementary School after Michael T. Hughes, a respected community leader and former longtime board member. The resolution states, Whereas Michael T. Hughes distinguished himself as an educator in service to Mesa Public School District Number 4 and its students for many years, and whereas Michael T. Hughes served as an exemplary member of the governing board of Mesa Unified School District Number 4 for 20 years, and whereas Michael T. Hughes has contributed greatly to the development of the city of Mesa and the well-being of its citizens through his leadership and volunteer service, now therefore, it is resolved that in recognition of Michael T. Hughes's extraordinary work as an educator, governing board member, and citizen, Nathaniel T. Hawthorne Elementary School shall be renamed Michael T. Hughes Elementary School. During his 20-year tenure on Mesa Public Schools Governing Board, Mr. Hughes set high expectations for all students. He crafted strategic initiatives designed to close and eliminate achievement gaps and was a driving force for increased leadership and support for Mesa's growing Latino community. He supported programming to benefit all students, including advancement via individual determination, or AVID, options in science, technology, engineering, and math, referred to as STEM, and comprehensive English language acquisition programming and support. His work with A New Leaf helps disadvantaged families rise above difficult circumstances. His philosophy is, an education is the one thing in life that can't be taken away and provides a person a much greater chance of succeeding. 
It is a fitting tribute for a man who has influenced the lives of literally thousands of Mesa's children and families by advocating for and providing innovative services and programs, resources, and tools so they s can succeed. Nicholas Parker, principal at the soon-to-be Michael T. Hughes Elementary School, told me, Becoming Mr. Hughes's namesake symbolizes our belief in the importance of giving back to the community and doing what is best for our students. I look forward to joining the Hawthorne community at an official renaming celebration later this spring. March is Music in Our Schools Month, which is sponsored by the National Association of Music Education. It raises awareness about the importance of music education for all children. Our commitment to music education can be witnessed by award-winning instruction, accomplishments and performances, and just wonderful uh, performances by our students. Mesa Public Schools provides a variety of opportunities for students to participate in comprehensive music education, including band, choir, orchestra, and symphony. Our school music departments require large trophy cases to display their accolades, and I thought it would be appropriate to highlight some of their recent awardees. Mason Schreiber, choir director and department chair at Mountain View High School, and Christina Soper, band director at Hale Elementary and Stapley Junior High School, received the O.M. Hartzell Excellence in Teaching Music Award from the Arizona Music Educators Association. Carolee Hagen, orchestra director at Franklin East Elementary School, was named Outstanding Classroom Teacher by the Arizona Chapter of the American String Teachers Association. The Mountain View Orchestra Program under the direction of Dr. Walt Timmy and the Red Mountain Orchestra Program under the direction of John Haggard received the Arizona Band and Orchestra Directors Association William E. Richardson Program of Distinction Award for the 2016-17 school year, which was presented at the state conference earlier this month. Mesa High Senior Charlie Horn and Mountain View Senior Alan Haverson have been named in the 2018 All-State Jazz Band. Junior Mallory Mahoney, a bassoonist in the Skyline High School Band, was selected for a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to play in the Honors Symph Symphony Orchestra at Carnegie Hall in New York City. Mallory studies under the direction of Jennifer Howard. Finally, 255 band, choir, and orchestra students from our six high schools were selected to represent the district in the 2018 All-Regional Honor Festival. These honors are indicative of the incredible talent, experiences, and countless hours that our musicians, teachers, and directors contribute to the world of music appreciation. And we so appreciate their work. Congratulations go now to Robin Jackson from Red Mountain High School, Jessica Yan, Hannah Morgan, and Katrina or Katie Klontz from Westwood High School. The seniors were selected by the Mesa Citizen of the Year Committee to receive the 2018 Mesa Student Community Service Award. Founded in 1935, this award program recognizes community members who provide exceptional volunteer services. These outstanding young women demonstrate exemplary academic performance, commendable leadership skills, and strong commitment to service. Robin has exceeded 800 hours of service learning and volunteers at Banner Baywood Medical Center. She plans to attend the University of Michigan and study nursing so she can combine her passion for medicine with her love for helping people. Jessica began her service learning as a dog. Yes, you heard me right, a dog. She performed as Toto at Banner Desert Medical Center's Children's Wing. She is a peer counselor for Teen Lifeline, supporting teens across the country as they work through personal crises. Hannah has nearly 900 service learning hours, many of them supporting her Westwood High School community. She plans to study international relations and East Indian studies and hopes to become an ambassador. Katie found the Murals and Mosaics Art Service founded, excuse me, the Murals and Mosaics Art Service Club at Westwood High School and spends many hours volunteering at the Phoenix Zoo. She plans to double major in sustainability and agribusiness with an emphasis in communications. Congratulations to these students for receiving one of the most cherished community awards. Thank you for making a positive difference in the schools in Mesa. 
Mesa Public Schools World Languages programs provide opportunities for students to deepen their appreciation of French, German, Mandarin, Spanish, and American Sign Language. Got to wait for it to catch up to me. There we go. This summer, four district students will enrich their learning as representatives of the Mesa Sister Cities Youth Ambassador Exchange Program. The exchange program promotes long-lasting international relationships and provides top-tier students experiences. Ryan Coates, a junior at Red Mountain High School, will visit Upper Hutt, New Zealand. Westwood High School sophomore Tara Ruland will travel to Kuraz, Peru, and her schoolmates, junior Charlie Boyle and sophomore Nick Guerrero, will visit Guaymas, Mexico. Veronica Betance Sandoval, World Languages Specialist, shares that students who study languages become lifelong learners and global citizens. As I can personally attest, one never knows when they will be called upon to use world language experiences and leadership skills and new and exciting endeavors. Congratulations to our students on their upcoming travel opportunities, and I am confident that they will represent Mesa Public Schools with pride. Each spring, our district celebrates everything STEAM, which in science is science, technology, engineering, arts, and math at the annual SciTech Expo. Collaborators, including district staff, community members, and local businesses and organizations create a high quality, interactive, museum-like experience for attendees. Exhibits are meticulously designed to engage, inspire, and spark the imaginations of our students and community. This year's theme of STEAM education through the lens of civic engagement bridges community involvement and STEAM through events that include a blood drive, voter registration, and canned food collection. One of the most talked about demonstrations at this school year's event is Uber and their driverless technology. Keeping the gears spinning behind the scenes are content specialists Corinne Forbes and Cheryl McCaw, coordinator Colleen Howard, and the STEM Project Task Team. They collaborate with uh, exhibit designers, teachers, and students to create a place where everyone feels comfortable engaging in the exciting world of STEAM. This year's expo is hosted by Westwood High School this Saturday, March 3rd, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. The festival is free and open to people of all ages. We hope to see you there. Mr. President, Members of the board, this concludes the superintendent's report to the board, and I invite you to join me in front of the dais for this evening's recognitions. And Lynn Wolf, why don't you come join me up front? So Lynn is, the, Lynn is the palm coach at Mountain View High School and the palm squad. Would you please come join me now? I wondered why there was this mass of females right here. <laughs> so come on up here, ladies. The Lady Toro Palm Line brought the Division I All-Girls Palm title back to Mountain View with their stellar performance in the AIA Spirit Line State Championships at Chase Field last month. These high-energy athletes are judged on their execution of movement, skill level, timing, musicality, and showmanship. The Palmies spend countless hours practicing technical dance routines and synchronizing motion in preparation for performances, pep rallies, and competitions. Lynn, would you like to introduce um, your talented athletes here? And I've got a little cheat sheet here if you want to make sure that you got everybody. Oh, you test me? <laughs> yeah, we can test you. All right, let's try this. Let's try this. Okay, actually, my two captains are standing right here. This is Kylie Barney, Abby Arnett, Gigi Damiani, Scout Rhymes. Skylar Gallagher, Maddie Kerr, Tatum Cousy, McKinley Beckerman. I almost called her her nickname. She probably wouldn't have loved that. <laughs> Let's see. Lacey Beatty. Lacey, who's behind you? Tori Kerr, Aspen Dendler, Kennedy Stokes, Bridget Reynolds, and Kyla Davis. These state champions were in good company at the end of the competition as the girls' stunt team took second place and Toro Cheer took third 
for a one, two, three punch, if I remember correctly. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Congratulations on these extraordinary accomplishments, ladies. We'd like to have one of you just share a little bit of your experience. Who would you like to pick, Coach? I, I, know, I know most of your parents, <laughs> so do you want me to ask your parents? Okay, ready? One, two, three. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> okay, so like our, actually she didn't mention this, but um, so we have nine seniors, four juniors, and then one freshman, so no sophomores. And um, so at the beginning of this year, we made goals as a team and individually, but we had a goal to accomplish those goals as a team. And I am so grateful to have ended my Palm experience taking home a state and national title with my team and um, our team is special. We have a bond that I've never felt before on a team and I'm so grateful to have experienced this. And um, um, Palm has taught me the importance of hard work and dedication. And um, I just wanted to thank you guys for making high school so memorable with, um, <laughs> um, and I love you guys. And I'm sorry for the parents and for the coaches for your endless support. So thank you. This is no little task. These ladies are mighty academically and athletically, and it is always an honor to see you and your performances, and then to receive this recognition is quite an outstanding thing. If you're a parent of one of these young ladies, would you please stand to be recognized or wave your hand? Uh, Mr. Kerr, wave your hand. We know you're a proud dad over there. Congratulations to all of you as well. We also recognize Principal Greg Milbrandt. Are you here, Greg? There he is in the back. Roxanne Perrin, is Roxanne here? There's Roxanne along the wall. And Dr. Steve Hogan, our District uh, Director of Athletics. And he's over there in the corner as well. Congratulations to all of you. <laughs> Ladies, we'd like you to uh, meet and greet our governing board. So starting with Coach, we're going to have you start there and work that way around, okay? Okay, next I'd like to recognize our individual Division I state champion wrestlers who also hail from Mountain View High School. Will individual gold medalists Jonathan Garcia and Jeremiah Holland, along with Coach Corey Anderson, please join me up front. Let's have a hand for these folks. A fully conditioned wrestler is the most anaerobically fit athlete of any sport. With precision and power, a wrestler executes a burst of energetic moves every six to 10 seconds during a match. Congratulations to Jonathan, raise your hand, Jonathan. There he is, and Jeremiah, raise your hand. There he is. Um, on your achievement at the state championships, Jonathan beat Cibola High School's grappler 12 to six and won the 220 pound title, is that right? Okay. And Jeremiah pinned Boulder Creek High School's wrestler in 55 seconds to clinch the 195 pound title. So I'm gonna move over here for a while. <laughs> uh, um, Coach, congratulations on your season. Would you like to say a little bit about your athletes? Come on over. Um, I just wanna say that I think, you know, a lot of times in life we endeavor to, to set out to reach a high goal and for whatever reason, you know, through uh, we have a lot of diligence, we do things the right way, and it just doesn't end up. And so when somebody wins a state title, like our, like our POM team, 
when someone wins a state title like these individuals, you know, everything kind of came together for them through, uh, through their own diligence. They made the stars align for themselves, and there was an opportunity where their preparation met a moment, and they were able to seize that. And I think that there's, I think that there's something beautiful about that. I think there's something poetic about that, and I think that there's, that's just a moment that, that's great to share. But I think lost in that sometimes is, are the individual stories. Um, we, we celebrate the championship, but don't celebrate maybe the stories. So just quickly, Jeremiah Holland last year, uh, rewind a year, lost in the state finals in about a minute. He was pinned, and so he saw dreams get crushed. Had to live with that for a year, had to come back, had to steal himself, and he came back this year and made good on that. And to see the tremendous pride that he felt, to watch his mom and dad well up with pride, to watch our teammates well up with pride, and support him is, is truly a great thing. Jonathan's story is a little bit different. Um, as a ninth, 10th grader, Jonathan didn't have a lot of direction in school. Didn't necessarily uh, come to class every day with his pen and his notebook. But as he invested more in wrestling, as he invested more in himself, he became a better student, became more productive in life. He said to me a couple weeks ago, he said, Coach, I don't know what I'm gonna do when this is all over because you know, I kinda wanna keep wrestling because it's gonna help me stay, stay where I need to be in life. And so we've explored some options. He has some, some scholarship offers that are on the table currently. Uh, he wants to come back and be a teacher and a coach in Mesa Public Schools. And so, so, you know, the trans, yeah, go ahead and clap, that's good. Uh, I just feel like that's part of the transformative process of high school athletics is which I, why I feel it's so important uh, that, that kids are constantly participating and, and we provide those opportunities for them. I would like to say thank you to everybody for, for allowing me to share their, their stories. These are wonderful young men. Thank you very much. If you are family or here for Jonathan or Jeremiah, would you please raise your hand so we can recognize you as well or stand or, or take a bow. Congratulations. <laughs> we recognize that um, a lot of grit and tenacity out of these young wrestlers as well as our Palm team over here, uh, but that also means that there's a great deal of encouragement and um, get out of bed and get to practice um, kind of comments from parents as well, right? Uh, not to mention your diet. Um, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's congratulate both sets of state champions. And uh, we express our appreciation again to Principal Milbrandt, Roxanne Perrin, and Dr. Steve Hogan for your leadership in these areas as well. Thank you again, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Congratulations. Next on the agenda are spotlight recognitions. This program gives our community a more comprehensive view at our schools, programs, and departments and allows us to recognize some incredible individuals. This evening's spotlight recognitions include Summit Academy, Hale Elementary School, and our Food and Nutrition Department. Will Mark Andrews, Principal of Summit Academy, please join me at the podium while we watch a brief video about your school. Hi, I'm Mark Andrews, the proud principal of THE Summit Academy. Where it's all about the students. And we're serious about success. Summit Academy is a kindergarten through eighth grade school with two separate campuses. The Summit Academy kindergarten through sixth grade campus follows the International Baccalaureate Primary Years Program. The Primary Years Program is an inquiry-based educational framework that seeks to develop the whole child in that it recognizes the importance of the academic, social, emotional, cultural, and physical development of all students at their individual learning and social emotional levels. Summit Academy's aim and mission statement is to develop globally minded lifelong learners who are empowered to become caring, responsible citizens that positively impact the world. Summit Academy incorporates a distinctive set of attributes to facilitate our mission statement. These qualities are embodied in the IB Learner Profile, which is made up of teaching students to be inquirers, knowledgeable, thinkers, communicators, principled, open-minded, caring, risk-takers, balanced, and reflective. 
In the final year of the primary years program, students participate in a culminating project known as the exhibition. Students are required to engage in a collaborative inquiry process that involves them in identifying and offering solutions to real life issues. After graduating from the primary years program, students transition to our 7 to 8 campus where the IB middle years program encourages students to make practical connections between their studies and the real world. All subject areas collaborate and share common unit planners based on themes that also incorporate the learner profile but add the middle years approaches to learning. These include communication, social, self-management, research, and thinking. Ultimately, the Middle Years program aims to develop active learners and internationally minded young people who can empathize with others and pursue lives of purpose and meaning. The program empowers students to inquire into a wide range of issues and ideas of significance locally, nationally, and globally. The end result is young people who are creative, critical, and reflective thinkers that will positively guide the future of our world. Summit Academy, congratulations. <laughs> Principal Andrews, would you introduce us to some outstanding people? Thank you, Dr. Cowan. Um, Summit Academy is an international baccalaureate primary years and middle years program, a school that focuses on developing the whole child through an inquiry-based rigorous curriculum. We are serious about success and all about our students. Tonight, I'd like to recognize a few spectacular members of our community. Emily Wilbanks, eighth grade student, please join me at the podium. <laughs> Emily is phenomenal and exemplifies what it means to be an IB learner. She's open-minded, honest, principled, and caring to students and staff. She excels in communication and is wise behind her, beyond her years. Never satisfied with mediocrity, she consistently challenges herself. An attentive leader, she makes an impact in her community through her participation in Summit Sustainability Club and Visual Arts Program. I am honored to recognize you, Emily, as our outstanding student. <laughs> right. Emily, please stand in front of the table on your right as we celebrate another member of our community. Dr. Elizabeth Libby Nelsch, school psychologist, please join me at the podium. Libby is committed to meeting students' individual academic, social, and emotional needs. She offers wisdom, guidance, and solutions to challenging situations. She effectively leads staff and families in working together for the best interest of our students. Libby is incredibly professional and caring. Her diligent work ethic and commitment have made a positive impact on countless students. I am honored to recognize you, Libby, as our educator who makes a difference. Libby, please stand next to Emily as we celebrate one more special member of our community. Tyrone Figaro, Campus Security Specialist, please join me at the podium. Tyrone, a.k.a. Coach, goes above and beyond to ensure Summit staff and students are safe. He's passionate about being involved at all levels at our school. He's an active part of our athletics program and took an unfilled coaching position this year when the season was nearly canceled. Coach also mentors and tutors students. He puts the needs of others first and is a blessing to our community. I am honored to re recognize you, Tyrone, as our customer service champion. <laughs> if you guys wouldn't mind going down the line and shaking the board members' hands. And thank you for giving us this opportunity tonight to share some of the great things about our school. Thank you. Let's have one more round of applause for Summit Academy. <laughs> Our next spotlight shines on Hale Elementary School with Cindy Hayton, the Hale School Principal. Please join me at the podium while we watch a brief video about your school. There she is. Hello and welcome to Nathan Hale Elementary School. Call us the heroes! At 
at Nathan Hale Elementary, we educate the whole child. Not only do we provide our students with opportunities to develop full academic potential, we appeal to individuality through multiple strategies to sharpen intelligence. We understand the importance of a connected school and community. Our focus is on achieving the shared vision of supporting students and meeting their needs as they work to reach their full potential. Our teachers stage to engage in the classroom and that means they really cultivate a holistic learning experience for the students by transforming the room into something that they can experience through all five senses. Hale has been recognized by the state of Arizona for being an A school. At Hale Elementary, we care deeply about the achievement and well-being of every single child in the school. We work hard to maximize the positive impact of our educators and staff have on our students. Hale offers so many things for every student. We have something for everyone. We offer music curriculum, band and orchestra. We offer art. For students who like to be active, we have Fitness Factory and Run Third. For students who love to use their science and math skills, we have STEAM Club, which incorporates an hour of code. At Hale Elementary, our hardworking staff and hardworking students make this a great place to be. Hale Elementary is truly an amazing school. That's Hale Elementary School. Congratulations. <laughs> Principal Hayden, would you like to introduce us to your honorees? Dr. Cowan. Hale Elementary is a very special community. We focus on achieving the shared vision of supporting students by meeting their needs as they work to reach their full potential. And tonight, I'd like to recognize a few of our special Hale heroes. Kurt Darrell Peterson, will you please join me at the podium? Kurt is a sixth grade student at Hale. Kurt loves learning. His motivation, effort, and willingness to take calculated risks have helped make him a successful mathematician, robotics engineer, and computer programmer. He inspires and encourages his peers by sharing alternative strategies and sincerely considering others' thoughts and ideas. He's a fantastic friend and leader and a scout who contributes to our community. I am honored to recognize you, Kurt, as our outstanding student. And you can stay right there in front of that table, Kurt, as we celebrate another member of our community, Mr. Jerry Herbel, fourth grade teacher. Please join me at the podium. Jerry's engaging personality brings the classroom to life. A very knowledgeable teacher, he crafts lessons that inspire the love of learning. He's passionate about education and goes above and beyond to create a positive school climate. Jerry makes it a point to really get to know his students and their families. He is always smiling and makes everyone feel welcomed and valued. I'm honored to recognize you, Jerry, as our outstanding educator who makes a difference. Congratulations. <laughs> Terry Reese, Child Nutrition Elementary Manager, would you please join us at the podium? Terry makes our cafeteria feel like home, where you are always welcome at the table. With her constant smile, she ensures everything is prepared for our students and that a busy lunch routine runs smoothly. Forgotten money and sticky spills are quickly remedied with understanding and dignity. She is kind, compassionate, encouraging, caring, and fun. I am honored to recognize you, Terry, as our customer service champion.
Thank you for giving us the opportunity to recognize some of the wonderful people at Hale Elementary. Our last spot night of the evening shines on our food and nutrition department. Loretta Zulo, Director of Food and Nutrition, please join me while we watch a brief video about food and nutrition. Hello, my name is Loretta Zulo and I'm the Director of Food and Nutrition for Mesa Public Schools. And today I'd like to share with you a little bit about what we do here at Food and Nutrition. The Food and Nutrition Department supports the educational process by serving healthy meals to our students, providing them the nourishment they need to be successful in the classroom. We believe that a hungry child cannot learn. We have 528 adult employees in our department, as well as 192 student employees in our junior high and high schools. It takes the collective efforts of everyone to prepare and serve over 55,000 meals a day. Food safety is our top priority and we're very proud of our food safety record. Our focus on food safety is supported by our partnership with Maricopa County Environmental Services and our participation in their cutting edge program. The managers are Serve Safe certified and our school kitchens meet rigorous food safety standards every day. The school day begins very early in our department from the time the first truck rolls away from the food and nutrition warehouse to the time the last pan is washed and put away, these hardworking and dedicated employees accomplish amazing things every day. The food and nutrition staff members have the unique opportunity to interact with just about every student in the school. These men and women are caring individuals who strive to build strong student-centered relationships with their customers. They decorate their kitchens to create a warm and welcoming environment, recognize accomplishments, and celebrate individual successes. They greet their customers by name and offer a friendly smile to brighten their day. Thank you, Angel. Have a great day. To support the work that happens in the kitchens across the district, there's a team of professionals in the central office. These folks take care of business in the areas of human resources, technology, procurement, accounting, free and reduced meal eligibility, and program oversight. We love coming to work because we have the best job ever we feed kids. That's our food and nutrition department. <laughs> Loretta, why don't you introduce us to some of your team members? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Cowan. The food and nutrition department prepares healthy meals that provide the nourishment our students need to be successful. Our team members deliver world-class customer service, ensuring lunchtime is a bright spot in every child's day. Tonight, I'd like to honor a couple of members of our team. So Linda Lason, Child Nutrition Manager, please join me at the podium. <laughs> okay. As Sharp School's Cafeteria Manager, Linda serves students of a variety of ages. Her days can be filled with unexpected challenges when she always meets with a positive attitude. Linda is friendly and welcoming, acknowledging each student as an individual. She makes a huge difference in their lives, whether or not she realizes that. I am honored to recognize you, Linda, as our employee who makes a difference. <laughs> Paula Scouton, Secretary. <laughs> Please join me at the podium. Oh. <laughs> Paula sets the gold standard for customer service. She fields daily calls from kitchen staff, job applicants, parents, vendors, school secretaries, teachers, administrators, and superintendency. Paula sincerely listens to each customer making them feel important. She's friendly, outgoing, and funny. 
You can hear the warmth and smile in her voice. I'm honored to recognize you, Paula, as our customer service champion. Thank you for letting us shine the spotlight on food and nutrition and all those who impact the lives of our kids every day. Thank you to our master educators and top-notch employees. Your individual and collective efforts engage and inspire young learners every day. You give children the tools to be successful in life, which is evident in the outstanding students honored this evening at, at the meeting, and we congratulate you. Our spotlight recipients receive a certificate of appreciation and an Amazon gift card for personal use from the Mesa Public Schools Foundation. In addition, outstanding students are recognized with an official portrait to be displayed in the governing boardroom, as you can see last month's designees over here. We will take a brief three-minute recess now and allow our honorees and guests to continue with their evening plans. Uh, you may receive congratulations and take photos in the lobby. M Mr. President, members of the board, this concludes our presentations. And again, ladies and gentlemen, congratulations on your recognitions. of the Summit Academy. Where it's all about the students. And we're serious about success. Summit Academy is a kindergarten through eighth grade school with two separate campuses. The Summit Academy kindergarten through sixth grade campus follows the International Baccalaureate Primary Years Program. The Primary Years Program is an inquiry-based educational framework that seeks to develop the whole child in that it recognizes the importance of the academic, social, emotional, cultural, and physical development of all students at their individual learning and social-emotional levels. Summit Academy's aim and mission statement is to develop globally-minded lifelong learners who are empowered to become caring, responsible citizens that positively impact the world. Summit Academy incorporates a distinctive set of attributes to facilitate our mission statement. These qualities are embodied in the IB Learner Profile, which is made up of teaching students to be inquirers, knowledgeable, thinkers, communicators, principled, open-minded, caring, risk-takers, balanced, and reflective. In the final year of the primary years program, students participate in a culminating project known as the exhibition. Students are required to engage in a collaborative inquiry process that involves them in identifying and offering solutions to real-life issues. After graduating from the primary years program, students transition to our 7-8 to eight campus where the IB Middle Years program encourages students to make practical connections between their studies and the real world. All subject areas collaborate and share common unit planners based on themes that also incorporate the learner profile but add the middle years approaches to learning. These include communication, social, self-management, research, and thinking. Ultimately, the Middle Years program aims to develop active learners and internationally minded young people who can empathize with others and pursue lives of purpose and meaning. The program empowers students to inquire into a wide range of issues and ideas of significance locally, nationally, and globally. The end result is young people who are creative, critical, and reflective thinkers that will positively guide the future of our world. Hello and welcome to Nathan Hale Elementary School. Call us the heroes! At Nathan Hale Elementary, we educate the whole child. Not only do we provide our students with opportunities to develop full academic potential, we appeal to individuality through multiple strategies to sharpen intelligence. We understand the importance of a connected school and community. Our focus is on achieving the shared vision of supporting students and meeting their needs as they work to reach their full potential. 
our teachers stage to engage in the classroom and that means they really cultivate a holistic learning experience for the students by transforming the room into something that they can experience through all five senses. Hale has been recognized by the state of Arizona for being an A school. At Hale Elementary, we care deeply about the achievement and well-being of every single child in the school. We work hard to maximize the positive impact of our educators and staff have on our students. Hale offers so many things for every student. We have something for everyone. We offer music curriculum, band and orchestra. We offer art. For students who like to be active, we have Fitness Factory and Run Third. For students who love to use their science and math skills, we have STEAM Club, which incorporates an hour of code. At Hale Elementary, our hardworking staff and hardworking students make this a great place to be. Hale Elementary is truly an amazing school. Hello, my name is Loretta Zuo and I'm the Director of Food and Nutrition for Mesa Public Schools. And today I'd like to share with you a little bit about what we do here at Food and Nutrition. The Food and Nutrition Department supports the educational process by serving healthy meals to our students, providing them the nourishment they need to be successful in the classroom. We believe that a hungry child cannot learn. We have 528 adult employees in our department as well as 192 All right, you can continue to celebrate, just not in here. We'll get started here in just a minute. Um, next with a presentation on athletic eligibility. You wanna? Thank you, Mr. President. We have our district director of athletics with us, a um, man well renowned for his expertise and leadership, not only here in Mesa Public Schools, but across the state, Dr. Steve Hogan. All right, good evening, thank you. Am I on yet? Um, first off, I, I appreciate the opportunity to come in and, and speak on this because it's been a great success. It's one of those programs, which is kind of a policy change that we made some slight changes that have had a huge impact. Uh, I really couldn't have asked for a better lead up than our wrestling coach and, and the young wrestler who has struggled, but through athletics and through you know, academic monitoring and things, you can see how you know, we, we kind of look at, it, at athletics as probably one of the best academic intervention programs we have. You know, it's what keeps kids involved in school in a lot of times. So you saw a great example of that. Um, have a PowerPoint presentation to show you. I don't know, uh, there we go. Um, it mysteriously appears. Yes, so. it comes up. Thank you, Rock Leonard, we appreciate it. Um, Basically, this program is, is just a slight tweak from what we've done in the past. Uh, athletic eligibility is basically um, a student must be passing all of their classes, a minimum of five. Unless they are a senior online to graduate, then they can be in four and be doing the same type of thing. So that did not change. Um, what is different is, I don't see how you guys can see all that. That's, that's far away. I'm going to have to get, get a closer monitor. But... Uh, but what is different, and a little bit again, what we did in the past was we would check the student athletes. We would not check the freshmen until they started, until they're nine weeks great. That was the first time we would do an eligibility check. All other students are checked at the beginning of the semester, and if they are failing, then they have the opportunity to regain eligibility at the four and a half weeks progress reports. If they were ineligible then, the next step would be at the nine weeks. So it was every four and a half weeks was the earliest a student could really regain or even lose eligibility. What we changed that to was is that we still check students at the beginning of the semester. We changed the freshmen so that they were being checked at the four and a half weeks. And then we would check them every week subsequent from that point on. And we found that to be, a, again, a huge success because what it's allowed the students to do is they're far more motivated to do better quicker. Um, instead of having that four and a half weeks, my season's almost over, why am I even trying and a little bit of give up and these are students who are academically challenged so sometimes they don't have that tenacity to stick with it where now hey one week later 
a nice outgrowth of this we also found where our coaches were a little bit more motivated because instead of saying, well, I'm not going to get that student back for four and a half weeks, it's like we can get them back out on that field in another week. So I, I, that was not an intended consequence, but kind of an unintended result and benefit of this program. So there was a few more interventions, which we'll get to a little bit later. One of the things that we did, as you can see, is uh, there's a timeline for all eligibility checks. We kind of found in trying to um, describe this that this pretty much says it all. This is when we check, who we check, when are they eligible, when can they regain eligibility, when do they lose eligibility, and who are they. So this is a, a neat thing about this is one document that almost explains everything. It's online, we've educated all the teachers, the parents, the coaches, the athletes, so they see this and it's, it's really pretty self-explanatory. And we've really have had no problems with this as far as just making people aware and this one sheet pretty much has taken care of a big part of that. Um, again, the feedback is the students are far more motivated to do better um, and to really take it seriously because they have an opportunity. There's that carrot that comes quicker. Instead of waiting that four and a half weeks, that's been one huge thing. Is that shorter time frame has been huge. Um, a follow-up with this is there have been a couple of other districts, Gilbert for one, they were doing their eligibility revamp almost the same time they were about a month behind us and then they were like what do you do now what do you do now and we just kind of fed and theirs is almost mirrors ours so just you know not not just in athletics but in so many other areas mesa schools kind of leads the way and others see what we're doing and try and follow and mimic and i think that's that's you know that's neat that's good that we do that um, one of the, the biggest outgrowths or outcomes of this was the freshman um, the freshman in the past again were not checked until the first nine weeks and you know, you've probably heard Dr. O'Reilly, and I've heard him say many times, is that the most important semester or time of a student's academic career is their first semester of their freshman year. Those students that fall behind at that point struggle to ever catch up. And when we look back at this, seeing that we didn't check them until nine weeks, we're not doing any interventions, sometimes not identifying who those students are, we have an idea and coaches were working with them, but now it was very tangible, measurable, things that we could intervene. So now we're finding out on those freshmen at four and a half weeks. Um, and that was huge. Uh, we had quite a few kids. I think we had like 190 students that were ineligible at the four and a half weeks of our first semester in the fall. And, but the interventions and things that took place got those kids back on track. If there's anything that personally that I would say, what do you think of our eligibility policy? To me, this is the number one thing. Yes, having the athletes the ability to gain their eligibility after one week is a big, but I think the opportunity that we had to intervene with freshman student athletes, coaches provide study halls, extra tutoring, working with those students, um, uh, intervening with teachers, talking with teachers, talking with parents to get these kids back on track as soon as we could was huge. And I, I just think that was one of the biggest things. A, a couple other things that have happened with this is we've identified some problems at our schools with some grading policies. So this worked out great to come in, and not really problems, but just identified some various issues. Um, so it, it's really helped our principals and administration as we've gone to a new grading policy. It's identified where are some of the teachers or so, some of the issues that are popping up because maybe a student was deemed ineligible and they can look at and, and the parent might say, why are they ineligible? They're doing this, this, this. And maybe that teacher was not getting the grades in, or maybe there was a, um, they were not having enough formative assessments, those types of things. That was rare, but it was great that we could identify them and we could really kind of piggyback on our new grading policy and really use this as another tool to really kind of monitor it and adjust it and find out where are the weaknesses and the strengths and how is that working. So that was another nice benefit of that. And the last one is the parents. You know, the parents are aware, I feel, of the portal and how they can uh, check the eligibility, but in the athletic world, they are definitely aware. Uh, I think it has really encouraged parents to get on, check and see how their students' grades are doing. Um, quite often, uh, they're, my student, uh, my child is now passing, why are they not eligible? And we have to tell them that, well, we do the check on Monday. So they're constantly not only monitoring it themselves, but monitoring it with their child to make sure they're doing well academically. So that is really kind of it in a nutshell. One of the, the last thing here, and, and you would have to kind of look a little bit close, but this, if you start at the bottom, the bottom in red, that is the first nine weeks. And it's very easy to see the impact. At the beginning of the semester, these are students that failed a class the previous year. 
So at that point in our district, there are 152 students were ruled ineligible for our sports in the fall. And that's just for the fall sports. After our grade check of, uh, on August 21st, we were down to 53, then to 37, then to 30. So you could see students were working diligently to regain their eligibility. Then you see the jump to 193. That is that four and a half week progress report when the freshmen were checked. So you could see all of a sudden, wow, where did this, why did this number go up so high? It was because of that athletic eligibility. And then you see the trend continue to go down, 129, 97, 84, and then it jumps again at the next, next um, end of the nine weeks. Part of that jump is really related to the fact that now we are including all of the winter sports. So now we're doing the very first check of all the soccer players, the wrestlers, the basketball players. So there was an increase, and this was also a lot of times just the students who were going to try out. We don't even know if they're on the team yet. So now we're checking almost half of our school uh, because we're still doing the fall grade checks. We're doing all the winter sport athletes, and you can kind of see a trend, which helped us again to identify a little bit better is what sports are there particular sports where students are struggling and what can we do so that chart kind of we continue to uh, monitor that our schools update that every week and you can see and, and part of that was just to explain why are there peaks why are there certain peaks and that's because like here we just had a recent one with the spring sports so um, again this program has been I think a phenomenal success in so many ways uh, I think it's really helped our students and our athletes uh, not only to get eligible, but just to do better academically and do interventions sooner. And that's my presentation. So, any questions? Perfect. Thank you. Um, and thank you for this. Uh, you know, we, we kind of tasked you with, uh, or we, we challenged you uh, to come up with something. And, and I think you've shown that what you've put together was successful. Uh, my only question was uh, related to something that we talked about kind of during this whole process and that was the level of burden that it had on the teachers. Have you had any feedback? Have we heard any, have we had any resistance from the teachers saying that this, because of these extra grade checks, they were staying until? I think you had a little bit early because it was new and it was different. Uh, I think once they saw it and also saw the grading policies and how they all kind of intertwined, I think they very quickly came on board. Um, so I really think the feedback was, has been positive even from teachers. I know, um, uh, Ms. Sears, you had a concern when we first talked about putting it in too soon. So uh, I think to alleviate that and that concern, we spent a lot of time last spring and throughout the summer giving them plenty of time so the teachers knew. Because a lot of them uh, not only use Gradebook, but they use Canvas. And sometimes their grades are on Canvas, but Gradebook is what we use to monitor this. So there was a little bit there, but I think those have all been worked through and it's really been pretty positive. Are there additional policies or procedures that you'd like the board to consider to fine tune this further or you think we're in good shape for right now? Boy, that's a great question. If I didn't know <laughs> that, I'd have a whole lot of things to come through. But no, I think right now we're in pretty good shape. I think things, uh, especially in our policies and procedures, we're in, we're in a good place. And I think this has been a great benefit. You know, and, and again, coaches, going back to, I mean, it's positive. Everybody, I've talked with student athletes, parents, teachers, coaches, administrators, there's been no negative and even the secretaries that we were afraid it might be a bit of a more burden on them uh, again initially but once they kind of saw it and we walked them through it said what did you used to do and they would explain so well, okay here's how we do it now and we sat down with them and they were right on board so it's been very good it sounds like there's been some unexpected positive consequences that have come from this. I wonder if this helped the instructors to get more into a routine of checking all their students more often, if that, in help, if that helped them with that process. Yes, and that's why I say that, because they, they know that they're being checked. They know that the parents are watching. They know that they have to get the grades in, because immediately, as soon as a student is hoping to become eligible, and they go on there and there's no grade, they're on the line. So well, I I'm, think I'm it helped them to do that, and that's what's happening not just with the athletes, it's happening with all students. Right, that's what I was, yes. yeah, all yeah, students. They're, they're just, if I'm going to do it for this group, I've got to do it for everybody, so it's yeah. been great. Yep. Good. Well, Any other questions? That's always good news when something we do works yeah. so well, and thank yeah, and you. Yeah, and that's where I mentioned, I think one of the other consequences of this is it being identified by the administration to see, you know, maybe some teachers that were not getting things in the grade book. And it's like, okay, you get on board and 
So it's been very positive. And kind of a related question, where are we in having those two systems talk to each other? I know we were looking at having them so that it cuts down on some of that uh, duplicate work for teachers, that they can see it on the... The work is long and hard. Why don't we have Helen come on up and she can give you some details. Thank don't you, walk Steve. away, Steve. Stay close. Yeah. <laughs> So the educational technology team in IES, but primarily educational technology is working with the vendor on that. They have missed several deadlines with us, so um, we continue to strive to get that to happen as quickly as possible. It's definitely a priority for us. Unfortunately, it, much of it is out of our control because we're working with vendors and we'd like the vendors to cooperate both with us and with each other as well as with our deadlines that we've requested. Because I, I think that will help too. Because you see a jump that happens. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not bothered by it, but you see a jump that's still happening at our grade reporting times, which to me means we're still not getting all of those grades entered in enough time because really they should be aware of that all along. And so that, that jump at the grade reporting time isn't so so much bigger because it's been reported all the way along. So those, those, those grade jump periods do not necessarily reflect when grades are entered. Those are the periods that we check. And so um, we don't have any data here that speaks to how prompt on a weekly or a regular basis those grades are actually getting into the, into the system. Holly, you might have some more details. I was gonna share anecdotally also, sometimes those grade checks are the time when the big summative assessment is, or an essay is due, or a project is, so sometimes you see those bumps because of that also. You get more information. That's right. Well, I, I couldn't be happier. To me, this was a big, a big piece, that we have students who come to school because they love athletics, and, and being able to provide them the academic support to be successful in it so that they don't give up and feel it does work hand in hand with that grading policy to look at making sure that we are not letting kids get so far behind in what they're doing so that they can Somebody asked me uh, not that long ago why we spend so much time and effort in my own family with sports. I said, because I, I don't have a farm. Like, we've got to teach these kids how to work hard, work and be tired, work hard and not be successful. You know, like, there's so many great lessons we learn, and I think the more kids we have learning those lessons, the better, the better life lessons. Like, learning the skill to sport is just, like, way down on my list of why my kids play sports, and so I really appreciate this helping more kids learn some of those valuable lessons that happen through athletics. So thank you, Steve. It's great. And, and again, I can't emphasize what a perfect lead-in with our wrestling. So we talk about that. I mean, here's somebody who might eventually thing. come back to be a Mesa Public Schools teacher that if they were, in my opinion, if they were not involved in wrestling, have a coach like Coach Anderson that's going to emphasize and, and stay on top of them and do that, that that's, you know, I want to win everything we can. But everything we do in athletics is just a tool to help make better people. I mean, that's, that's the purpose of it. You know, winning is more fun, and they buy in better. But it's, if we're here to help them be better. So. Steve, would, would it be accurate in saying that because we're checking it weekly, teachers don't know who the athlete is or is not or who's now going in in the springtime? So they're, they're taking... They're doing grades for all kids Correct. every week. Yeah, this is really not having a direct impact on those teachers outside of maybe identifying some that we're not doing this for all kids. Uh, the teachers are not doing the grade checks. We're just taking what the teachers are already putting in and we're doing the grade checks. So yes, the teachers per se don't even know who's being checked. They just know all kids are being checked. Yeah. And again, a lot of the bumps are really coming because all of a sudden we have the spring sports. You had 300 track athletes at Mount View and 300 track athletes at Red Mountain High School, and all of a sudden we're checking 600 kids that last week we didn't check. So all of a sudden you're going to see a bit of a bump in the ineligibility just because we're checking so many more, and you add baseball and softball and tennis, et cetera. So. I love the February 5th check, though. That's my favorite check of the year. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think I... Uh, I think I represent the board by echoing Jenny's uh, comments. Um, we really appreciate what you're doing and we see the positive impact. I think the lead in, like I said, with the wrestler, couldn't have been timed better uh, because that's, that's what I was thinking of as, as you went through your presentation. So 
appreciate your your work and your continued your continued dedication to Mesa Public Schools. Thank you. We appreciate you guys. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Hogan. Appreciate it. And with that, we've got some requests to speak. So we'll show a video on the call to public procedures. The governing board welcomes comments from the public. During the call to the public, please remember, each speaker is limited to three minutes. Comments must pertain to a matter that is within the jurisdiction of the governing board. This is not a forum to complain about an employee, student, or others. For this purpose, please use the procedures established in Policy KLD. State law prohibits board members from commenting on or discussing the matters presented. At the end of the call to the public, the board may ask the superintendent to review the issue or place it on a future agenda. A board member may also briefly respond to criticism of a board member or the governing board. Thank you for allowing this meeting to be conducted in a peaceful and productive manner. All right, thanks to our production crew for playing that. That's the first time, first time I think we've played it this year. Um, in no particular order, uh, we'll start with Jenny, is it Valley? Penny? We can start with Penny. So we'll start with uh, Penny Bloomquist. In no particular, in, in a new particular order. Well, thank you for listening tonight. My name is Penny Bloomquist. In the Mesa Public Schools, there are 800 people in the substitute pool and 150 of them are retired teachers. I am concerned about the low substitute pay for teachers who are retired with many years of experience in Mesa. As a recently retired teacher of 30 years, I believe we are undervalued and deserve higher pay. Rather than being paid $11.25 an hour or $90 a day, I believe it should be at least $18 a day, an hour, or $144 a day for retired teachers. As you know, the teachers in Mesa work very hard and learn skills that make them a very specialized skill set. When teachers retire, those specialized skills are the same. They just don't disappear overnight. They're ingrained into their lives. Retirement doesn't take away the passion or ability to perform. Since my retirement, I've been substituting in the classroom. My job in the classroom entails following the plans that the absent teacher has left for me. This is not a sit-down, babysit job. I am on my feet all day using the same skills that I have been trained to use as a professional and trained teacher. I teach, I maintain orderly conduct, and oversee that everything functions as it should on a normal school day. The more experience a substitute teacher has means more quality performance in the classroom. So many times I'm, I've heard from teachers, you're not the normal sub, you're great in the classroom. Many professions pay more to keep their more, most talented professionals, as does Mesa Public Schools. The more experience I had as a full-time teacher in the classroom was recognized by the district by an increase in pay throughout the years. I still have that experience but am paid less than some custodians, bus drivers or cafeteria workers in the district. Don't get me wrong, they perform invaluable work, but why am I paid the same or less as a person who doesn't have the same skill set or experience? In the Mesa Public Schools, when a substitute is not available, on-site teachers are asked to sacrifice their planning times to substitute in a classroom. They follow the absent teacher's lesson plan and do exactly as I would do as a substitute teacher. Those teachers are paid $18 a period for their work in addition to their regular pay. How is that substitute teacher different from me? We have the same skills and qualifications and should be paid the same. You may say, which I've heard, well, that is the market rate to pay subs, or it's all about supply and demand, or the budget doesn't allow for an increase. Several Fridays ago, there were 400 unfilled teachers' jobs in Mesa due to a lack of subs. Other teachers on the campuses had to fill in, specials were canceled, or students were asked to double up in classrooms. When other teachers have to fill in, it costs the district more than getting a regular sub. No cost effective at all, not cost effective. The market rate obviously doesn't generate the supply of substitute teachers needed to meet the demand. Demand is huge and supply is minimal. Make room in your budget. By compensating highly experienced retired teachers for their worth as invaluable professionals and not seeing them as babysitters, you will get the best there is as a substitute teacher in the classroom, thus achieving our common goal of giving the best we have to offer our students in the form of education. Thank you for listening. 
Thank you. And while I can't comment on, on your statements, I can, I think, comment on the fact that I appreciate your dedication. She was one of my teachers <laughs> at Lincoln. <laughs> uh, which one are you? Jenny. Okay. We'll go to Jenny. Good evening. My name is Jenny Valle, and I currently teach at Rhodes Junior High. I teach seventh grade English. Um, I'm also here to speak about the issue of sub shortage and sub pay. I'm not a substitute myself, um, but as a teacher, I know the importance of not only having a substitute in place of my absence for professional days, sick uh, doctor's appointments, um, but the value of having a qualified, specifically a certified teacher in my place. Um, in my experience teaching, I've taught here in Mesa for six years. I've had the opportunity to have not only qualified teachers, um, but also not so qualified substitutes. And um, upon your return, when you return from an absence with a not so qualified substitute, uh, it's pretty much a, a mess to come back to and, and a loss of a learning and instructional day. Um, usually that means that I need to go back and reteach those skills. Um, I've heard numerous times that uh, they were not, the lesson plans were not followed, or um, I need to reteach whatever concepts, uh, simple things like maybe even that pa the handouts were not even passed out. Um, having a certified and a qualified teacher there, especially specifically a retired teacher, would ensure that the lesson plans are not only followed, but that learning is taking place. Um, there have been, uh, for example, uh, especially with the, sub, uh, the issue of sub shortages, at Rhodes in particular last Friday, we had three teachers uh, short. And so all of the, uh, many of the teachers there on campus were asked to give up our time, our prep time. And so as mentioned, we were paid and compensated, but uh, it's just a, a domino effect. I then lose my planning time for my students and then uh, each of those days, uh, each of those classes in that classroom, the students were just getting random things and I, on, I genuinely felt bad for, for that class. Um, and, uh, what else was I going to say? I just feel that as, you know, if, if there was a way to solve this problem, I know that one of the, the ways to motivate and encourage uh, other retired teachers and qualified candidates to come and substitute, as she mentioned, with the, the amount of, if that was just roads and the amount of teachers that we were short, I can imagine across the board, um, that there were, sh there, there were not enough subs to fill their jobs. And so this just impacts children. And I feel that that is my main concern and my main issue. And in order to, to try to solve that problem, we do need to find a solution to try to motivate and encourage other teachers to come by increasing the pay, offering other incentives. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then Amanda, are you on the same topic? Uh, next we'll be uh, joined by Amanda Miley. Well, I don't have as eloquent as a speech as those two do, but uh, Amanda Miley, I've been in Mesa for five years now, and um, as they've said, you know, hard sub good substitutes are hard to come by, and the few former teachers or retired teachers that I have met that have subbed for me make a world of difference in the classroom. My students even tell me that they want those substitutes back when I'm not going to be there. I want them back when I'm not going to be there. It's come to the point where I don't even want to take a sick day or even my forced professional days off if I can't get one of these ladies in the classroom because every time I get a sub that I didn't line up and it's just some random person, I come back to a mess. I kid you not, one time the substitute went into my cabinets, took out my modeling clay, and handed it out to my students that I bought with my own money, not from the warehouse. And the kids didn't know why. They just said, well, she just gave it to us. Another time, I had a substitute feedback form that said she could not find my lesson plans that were a foot high 
on my teacher's desk that I took two hours to type up and copy and plan and put little post-it notes on. A whole day lost. So again, as, as Ms. Valle said, you know, it comes down to this is not what's good for kids. It is not good for teachers to have to reconcile the mess that is made when we can't get a quality sub in there. So if a pay increase would motivate these former teachers and these um, retired teachers to come to Mesa to substitute for Mesa, it would be beneficial to all. Thank you. And what school were you from? I'm at Lincoln. You're at Lincoln. Dr. Cowan, any comments? Yeah, Mr. President, thank you. I, I appreciate the comments by these three teachers. I don't disagree with them whatsoever. I've had those very similar experiences with qualified and less qualified teachers. I would say that some of the most qualified teachers I had in the classroom were actually um, not past retired teachers, but were actually parents of the students in my classrooms. Um, who um, knew what our routines were like, knew what our expectations were. And you're gonna find a similar kind of experience with what these, these wonderful educators and retired educators shared. Mr. Hol or Dr. Holmes is very familiar with um, uh, having visited with Penny on this matter and is, um, is a factor that of course plays into the meet and confer process. It is a factor that plays into um, budgets and all those things. And so he's working on strategies to see what possibilities there are available for us. It's a little premature right now as because we haven't set um, any proposals associated with the budget and we're still waiting for additional information to come in from the state. But I assure you that Dr. Holmes is on this and is looking to see what we can do to see if we can have the quality of teachers that these individuals represent as well as um, the kinds of good experiences they've had in the classroom. And Dr. Cowan, not specific to the, the conversation about retired teachers or certified teachers uh, being paid more, but uh, governing board members, if you do recall, maybe a couple of years ago, you approved our efforts to increase sub pay on a tiered approach where we pay 90 days or 90, $90 a day, $95 a day, $100 a day, and $105 a day as substitutes meet different thresholds of 45 day increments. So, you know, that is something that the board uh, endorsed from a, a, a recruitment standpoint, a, a, a competitive, uh, competitive with regards to our surrounding schools that we're competing for subs with, uh, but not specifically about retired teachers or yep. certified, yeah, certified teachers. So it's, it's, a, it's a work and study or it's a study and or work, however you want to put it, um, for us to look and see what we can potentially do here. Okay. Well, I appreciate the three of you coming forward and, uh, and the work that you're doing and the time that you're spending with our kids. And I apologize, uh, Chris Hamlet is next, and I, I made the assumption that he was not on the same topic. <laughs> okay, so uh, we'll, rec we'll welcome uh, Chris Hamlet. Thank you. All right, so the first, first thing, <clears throat> I enrolled my daughter in Mesa High um, the beginning of this year. I'm, I'm a single dad of two. I have this, this guy at Irving and her at Mesa High. And the first thing we did was have a meeting on our 504 plan. It has nothing to do with a disability. My daughter just thinks that school is a place to go and socialize. And when we had this meeting, um, I brought it to the attention of the English teacher and everybody in there that she came up with the seventh grade reading level and she's in ninth grade. And the first thing the teacher, the English teacher uh, told me was, well, a lot of these kids come in and they're at a fifth grade level. And that kind of floored me. Why are they coming in at a fifth grade level? Why is it acceptable? I mean, if, if she's coming in at ninth grade, she came from Taylor, why isn't she coming in at a ninth grade level? So it seems like we have kind of dumbed it down for the kids instead of putting our efforts into it to, to bring our standards up. And I'll get, I'll get into something else on that as well. This no left behind thing. And when we went into every single classroom at the beginning of the year, Almost every teacher said something along the lines of, you pretty much just have to show up to pass my class. And th that doesn't sit right with me. We don't have no accountability when it comes to their education. When, when, I, when I have teachers telling me that, that you just have to pretty much show up and put some effort into it and you can pass my class, that doesn't sit right. They have to earn their way through. Um, I agree with, you know, these, we don't wanna leave any students behind, 
But if they're being left behind, that falls on us as adults and educators in this district. That doesn't fall, and the parents, of course. That doesn't fall on the kids that we just lower the bar and just let them slide on through. And that's my issue with, with, with the education so far. Um, a couple other things I wanted to address were from this past week, this walkout. Um, I was told that no way, shape, or form could anybody in, in the staff or teachers be any part of this walkout. I didn't know what it was about at first until, until I found out a little bit later. Um, this walkout didn't have anything to do with building a shrine for these kids that were shot in, this, in a school shooting in Florida. It didn't have anything to do with prayer for them. It had to do with gun control. There's no, re there's no room in politics for my, in, in, in the school for my children, okay? My daughter already doesn't want to be part of it. Um, I, I try to get her into it. I try to teach her the truth about the stuff, but she even, she, she's not interested in it. She used it as an excuse to get out of fourth hour. And for, I was told that you can't make students stay on school. This is a closed campus at Mesa High. Why can't we do that? I didn't give her permission to leave that campus. I sure didn't give her permission to walk out and hear some mouthpiece talk about gun control and gun violence. Gun control and gun fi violence, that's something for adults to talk about. If the kids want to get into it, they can get into it, but there had to be some adult, there had to be somebody directing that. There's no way these kids got together without some mouthpiece and, and organize this thing on their own, other than, in my opinion, is to get out of class. That's all, that's all it was. Most of them were word of mouth. But so we find out that, that the police were there just to, I guess, make sure the thing was going okay. But regardless, I, I, I believe that there was a mouthpiece involved in that and it really shouldn't have. It was a big stage thing that shouldn't have happened. Um, the, said, the last thing I want to discuss is this emails that you guys send out regarding stuff like this. Like, for example, the other day I had this email, it was very vague, it said there was some, somebody, some student had something during an assembly. Um, it was a rumor that some student, for, so they decided to cancel the assembly and they exercised abundance of caution. All that was was a bunch of sugar-coated stuff that didn't tell me anything. Whether it was anybody not wanting to deal with, with parents, uh, upset parents calling in the school or the flow of calls that would have happened. But from what I understood from when I talked to my daughter was that it was somebody posted something about shooting up the school. So when you have somebody posting that, and you, if, if you guys can know, you know what that email was that went out the last week on that. It was very vague, it was sugar-coated, it didn't tell me anything, and I had to learn it from my 14-year-old. If there's something that serious, threaten, to threaten or not, if there's something that serious and somebody's threatening to, to shoot up a school, whether they post it on Instagram or it's a joke or whatever, it does not matter. They, the parents should know this. We should have had some kind of better communication than this big fluffy email. It had nothing to do with what was going on. So those are the things I wanted to address. If I can continue to see the way that the, the education goes in this district, you guys will continue to see me at this podium, okay? The, uh, and, and these vague emails, we need somebody, we need somebody, I understand, you don't, it, it, it seemed a little PC to me. I understand that you don't want to put people in a panic, but you also got to let us know as parents what's going on. You can't just send us emails and call it a rumor and say that we have an abundance of caution, so we decided to cancel an assembly and we have no idea what it was about. Thank you. Okay, th thank you, Chris. Uh, Dr. Cowan, any? Yeah, I'm actually looking over at Dr. Lesser, who was more direct in this, or um, Mrs. Williams, who were more directly involved in this. Do you have anything to share, uh, Dr. Lesser? Yeah, I would. In uh, regard at least to the last two items, I'm glad to speak to the first couple items. Okay. Um, Mr. Hamlin, thank you very much for sharing uh, your thoughts uh, just about the business that, that we're doing and, and the communications that we have. I would share with you that, uh, that we learn something probably from every communication that we send out to parents and they give us feedback about I need more information or, or it wasn't clear to me and, and I, I want to assure you that we walk away from those experiences. I would tell you in, in retrospect as we talk with our people, I think it's very appropriate in that email to say you know, that, that an element of or, or rumor of gun violence at an assembly w would certainly be appropriate. You probably will never hear us say, you know, a student said that they were gonna shoot up the school or, or you know, more of a, a slang kind of interaction, but I think it's very appropriate for us to say, you know, a, a rumor or a threat of gun violence on the campus. And for that reason, we've decided to reschedule the assemblies uh, to make sure that we've got the students monitored appropriately. And, and we talk about those things and, and we've uh, discussed those and we continue to do so, but I, I appreciate your feedback on that. Um, and, 
the, uh, with regard to uh, permission to leave campus, um, we do communicate about these particular uh, demonstrations that, that are popping up on our campuses, and you would find that that, that has occurred at Skyline High School. At May, it happened at Mesa High the other day. Uh, today it happened at uh, Dobson High School. Um, and our position as a district is not to, you know, we will use words such as, we will discourage students from leaving our campus, we will mark them absent and their parents will be notified if they're not in class. Uh, we will not physically engage with students to hold them on campus or lock the gates that, that they can't move out of, of any particular area. And, and I realize that that position may be up for debate with, with individuals. That just happens to be our position as we've talked as a leadership team and have consulted our legal counsel as well about what's the most appropriate way to handle students who want to exercise their freedom of speech rights to do so. And uh, so that's a little bit about the, the uh, protest gatherings. The, you know, a lot of these are occurring at the flagpole where they're attempting to give respect to the, the victims in, in uh, Florida. Some of them are then moving to you know, where the kids are, I want to say, m marching or moving to maybe the football field or a grassy area. Uh, my understanding with Mesa High that they did mo move down Harris and across to Emerald Park. Uh, we did. Uh, we regularly communicate with the Mesa Police Department when we know that things maybe will be expanded beyond the fences of our schools, and we do that simply to ensure that they, if they do cross streets, if there is a mass of students, that they do that safe, safely, and then we get it back to campus. So that, that's a little bit of information about those two items. And Holly, I don't know if there's uh, any other information you'd like to share. You know, the, the, Mr. Hamlin, I appreciate your also your comments about your daughter with her 504 and her experiences with academics and grade level reading and all those kinds of things. Those are a concern to us as well. You know, we, um, we are working hard to ensure that kids are, are introduced to and expected to have a certain cognitive or um, difficulty level of their academics. Um, many of these students come to us with deficit skills and requires a great deal of attention. So w I don't think you would find a single person here that would disagree with you at all. And it's a challenge for us in some instances to um, work with some teachers, not all of them, but I in some instances that don't um, have the same perspective as we do. And unfortunately, with um, 3,000 or so teachers, it's difficult for us to monitor what's going on in every single classroom. We rely on principals to do that, but at, for instance, at Mesa High, there's 175 teachers or so on that campus, which becomes burdensome for that administration to do that as well as manage 3,600 kids on a campus. And so we, we don't disagree with you. We fight that all the time, and uh, we commend you for, first of all, your attention to your daughter's education and helping her through um, those wonderful teen years of socialization, as well as um, demanding, as you should, um, a certain academic performance out of your daughter and those that she goes to school with. So please know that we're working on that ourselves. So thank you very much. And, and uh, let me just share one other thing, just, uh, and you may not be aware of this or not. These, these walkouts um, are disruptive to our educational program. Um, we have to abide by certain rights that students have. And then the other thing that's, that's important to note is this is not a Mesa Public Schools phenomenon. Um, if you are connected as we are to the national education environment across um, our country, um, thousands of schools have had very similar experiences to what Mesa High had this week with these walkouts. Um, it's a social media phenomena, it's a um, student activist phenomena, and in many instances, it's an activity for kids to go, hey, I'm going with them. Um, I'm not quite sure why I'm going with them, but I'm going with them. And um, we um, have to do two things. One, we have to do everything we can while they're on our campuses to ensure they're safe and secure. The Mesa police then take over when they leave our campus to ensure that those students are safe. 
and um, we anticipate and expect them to come back, as was the case with most of those students at Mesa High and the students at our other high schools as they come back and um, after their demonstration or their rally or their memorial, um, however you'd like to perceive it. But um, it creates a great deal of angst and anxiety amongst us as we uh, monitor their progress and activity and um, do everything we can to ensure they're safe. Yeah, thank you. Chris, thanks again for your for, for coming and for sharing that. Uh, with that, uh, we'll move on to item 13 on the agenda. I move for adjournment. All in favor? Everyone agree, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Long day. Aye. <laughs> None opposed, thank you. <laughs>